Okay, everybody out there in YouTube land, it is I, Matt Yancic, and welcome back to uh, another episode of GMs in the Machine. Uh, so it has, uh, as the kids say today, it has been a minute. Um, I'm sorry I haven't kind of gotten this program off the ground the way that I've been wanting to, but I'm hoping to sort of like get things back on track. Uh, and uh, on this program, as opposed to role player with a thousand faces, what I actually hope to do is sit down with a different game master every episode and uh, build, hopefully, an adventure, um, and then also talk to that game master about their process and kind of found it, find out like a little bit about like what they do, what are their magic secrets, the things that they do, how do they sprinkle little game master dust all over the game, what what makes it uniquely theirs. Um, so over the next couple hours or so. Uh, I'm going to be sitting down with none other than Anthony Fernandez from the Cypher Unlimited channel. And he and I uh, have sort of, he, he proposed the idea, um, uh, but we've been kind of cobbling together a few little things based on what, what he likes to do for his game. But we're going to sit down and hopefully build ourselves a really nice adventure. Um, but before we get to that, I, 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 you know, I wouldn't be me if I didn't try and hook you with like things that are coming up. Um, but just to let you know, we do have an episode of Role Player with a Thousand Faces that is going to be coming up uh, this Wednesday, I believe it is. And I'm going to have Daniel Kwan. Uh, Daniel Kwan is part of the Asians Represent podcast. Uh, he is a podcaster and he's a writer uh, and he's designed for Candlekeep Mysteries and Motherlands and Avatar Legends and uh, Dark Archive and a few other things. Um, I'm excited to have him on the program. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, uh, and so I hope you'll you'll tune in. Um, and n after that, following that, um, I believe it's number November 8th, I think it is, uh, I am going to have none other than Lil Red Dot. Uh, she's a storyteller, a, a host, a game designer, and excited to say she is also now the content production manager for Cobalt Press, which is nothing to sneeze at, um, nothing at all to, to sneeze at. Um, but anyway, even though those people are really cool and it's awesome to, to have them coming up, you, you, you came here for, for Anthony Fernandez. You came here for Spigs18. I, I don't know actually what that handle means. I'm afraid to ask him. I don't know. I kind of want to ask him. But I don't know. Maybe he'll just volunteer the information if it's not anything like too racy or I, I don't know, too, too like, we'll, we'll find out anyway. Um, but let's get to Anthony, our guest game master for tonight. Anthony, thank you very much. I know we've been talking about this for about 16 years now, 16 or 17 years, getting you on the program. How's it going over there? It's doing great. First off, Matt, thank you so much for you know having me participate in this. This, this is going to be awesome. You know, me and you get to chat all the time offline, so mm -hmm. to do it on camera, it's it's going to be extra special. Cool. And I'm honored that you invited me to. No, come I am. I am so my happy. DM secrets. I I'm happy to have you. I'm I'm looking forward to finding out uh, uh, what some of your techniques for for building and creating are. Uh, I I. You know, Anthony shared a little bit about that with me before the big program in the in the last few weeks leading up to this. Um, but we're going to go into that with a little bit more depth tonight. Um, and he will be kind of like introducing us to to some of the things that he does to build his game. So, um, Anthony, maybe just to sort of like start us off here. Uh, can you can you tell us a little bit about where the inspiration for for this game that we're we're going to build tonight comes from? Um, I think it just happened organically with, with a conversation between me and you when you first approached me about the idea of coming on. I you know I told you that uh, uh, one anyone that watches Cypher Unlimited knows that um in in the Cypher Unlimited community I'm yes. known as Napkin GM. Because I, you know, I I tend to be very minimalist in my style, especially when crafting one shots. And I, I, you know, everyone jokes that I could run a game off of a bar napkin, which I've done on several Gen Con. I <laughs> I've heard stories. I have. 
So, you know, we, we were just talking about that. And then I told you that I, I love to do mashups. You know, it's another thing I'm kind of known for on our Discord and in the community. I like to, you know, take two concepts, two existing either IPs or, or films or books and mash them together and come up with something new and different and uh, enjoyable for everyone involved. So we started thinking about, okay, if we're going to do a mashup, which you seem to like the idea, yeah. we started brainstorming ideas. And I don't know which one of us came up with Logan's Run and Planet of the Apes, but I think that's what we settled on. Yes. Yeah. And I and you say settled, but I think it, I, I was pretty excited by it. I, I also have to say I was kind of daunted by it because I was kind of thinking like, oh, my gosh, there's so much going on in Logan's Run mm. and in, in Planet of the Apes. Um, that I, I wasn't quite sure even where to begin. I thought that there might be uh, maybe too much stuff in there, but um, I, I don't know. We'll just sort of find out. Can you tell us, and, and I, didn't, I didn't actually say we we're going to do this, but thinking mm -hmm. back to it like in the last 15 minutes, I'm yeah. like, maybe this is a good idea. What, what's the story of Logan's Run basically in a sentence or two? Can you, can you give us like a summary for it? All right, for me... I, I think both one of the reasons why I think this is these two films make a perfect match is because they they drastically differ, but they have the same theme at the end, which I think it's you know that's like the perfect case when you want to mash up two things. They can be entirely different. There has to be some similarities so we could tie them together right. somehow. And you know, with Logan's one, it's essentially you know a, a coming of age story. You know where where I I don't I get I confuse the book with the film a lot. Yeah. But there's a certain age range where it's a, a utopian society where everyone lives to a certain age and then they get they get um executed for lack of a better term yeah. for the betterment of society. Yeah. Right. And there's this aha moment, you know, where the the hero discovers that you know this this is all a lie. And, you know, that's where the story dramatically changes. And I think there's where the similar, or at least I hope the two of us could figure out a way to connect these two films. Because I think Planet of the Apes has a similar concept. You know, it, ha it has the the uh, uh, a societal structure, mm -hmm. right, where someone comes in and finds the aha moment. Right. And, it, you know, without spoiler alert, you know, Planet of the Apes. Well. It was, Earth, it was Earth all along. You know what I mean? They both wait, have. Wait, what? <laughs> what? Why don't you just tell me there's no Santa? Or tell me that. <laughs> why don't we, while we're revealing stuff, why don't we just reveal that Vader is really Luke's father? And, yeah. And all that. But... So, so they both feed on the premise that there is, you know, a Rod Sterling or a M. Night Shyamalan twist yeah. at the end. And I think we can't encapsulate the entire story of both films, mm. but we could find one or two things that we feel represent the film well. And those are the things that we'll grasp and use, if that makes any sense. It, it does, actually. And to be honest, I'll, I'll say this again, like when you first and I, I'm pretty sure it was you that said that you wanted to mash them up. And mm. I was I was kind of like, what the how are we going to do this? But actually, I think you've just sort of like. You've just kind of encapsulated the 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 big like uh, the connection, and that's like that aha moment. So there's a moment. So in in Logan's Run, uh, the I think it's at in the movie, it's like it's a certain age, like thirty or thirty five or something. Yeah, John just um he told us he said it was thirty. So if okay. it's thirty in the movie, I believe in the book is twenty four or twenty six. I could be wrong. Okay. So there's but, a certain but I, age. I, I do the... know there was a, a difference in the in the movie and the film. Right, right. And I actually give you props for. I mean, the movie read and the book. book. It's yeah. like it's really amazing to meet anybody that's read like the Logan's Run book. But I, at a, at a certain age, the crystal in their hand sort of starts to flash and and turn mm -hmm. a certain color, and that means they have to go to Carousel and they have to sort of renew themselves, which is like in the movie. It's it's. I mean, in the world of the movie. They're getting like reincarnated and reborn, but actually, it's they they later the aha is they discover it's just like a straight up execution and their bodies are disintegrated and there really is no reincarnation. But you mentioned that 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 aha moment where there's this surprise moment, and then of course in Planet of the Apes at the very end of the film, 
Um, and this is going to be something that we might want to talk about, but at the end of Planet of the Apes, that's when Charlton Heston realizes that he is actually on Earth. He sees the Statue of Liberty. And the interesting thing to me, the, the similarity is that aha moment, but the difference is that in Logan's run, the aha moment is what forces Logan to run, and that's mm -hmm. what starts the whole story. But then at the end of Planet of the Apes, the aha moment is at the very end of the story. And that's kind of like what just puts a big twist on everything that's happened before. So mm. let me ask you this question then. Does this mean, you, first of all, does this mean you would like an aha moment in uh, Absolutely. In, in, order for, in order for this to be a true mashup, we have to figure out that aha moment. Okay. Now, whether, whether or not, I don't, you know, we only have four hours to tell a one shot, so I don't, I don't think that is, it's gonna work. Like, it's gonna work for us to have it in the beginning. So the the question will be whether or not we're gonna do it in the bridge or in the ending scene. Can you explain a little bit about? I I I know what you mean by bridge, but yeah. can you kind of tell us a little bit about? the way and I and I sort of know about the way I structure stuff. Yeah. But can you tell me when you envision your one shot, what do you mean by the bridge and and what's the structure of your one shot like? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I've explained this multiple times on our show, but I know I just realized I've never explained it here. Never. So. First time ever. <laughs> but go All ahead. right, so what I basically do for a one shot and I I find that this actually works really well with streamed one shots. If you go to our channel, you see I, I run a lot of stream run shots as well. I, I tend to build and concentrate on only three scenes. And my thought process is, is that I want to allow the, the players to build upon the narrative and to be flexible, me as a GM, to be able to be flexible enough to go in any direction that the players choose to go. Yeah. So... I, and I know this isn't a like a common opinion, but it works for me. I find that if I really hyper focus on three scenes, and what I mean by three scenes is I concentrate on the introduction scene, yeah, because that's going to draw the attention of the audience and the players. And then I have then I build out a bridge scene, which the bridge for me is no matter how far off the players go within the first two hours of the game, it's a scene that will allow me to reel them back into the you know the the actual narrative that i'm trying to tell right and then i build out a finale scene and and that scene is supposed to you know close out the session close out whatever story right you know and what i mean by close it doesn't necessarily mean a finale to the adventure but just a uh an agreeable ending as you know for the gm st stating hey this is a good place to end and I just build out those three scenes. And as long as I have those three scenes designed and I'm comfortable, mm. you know, running those three scenes, yeah, I could fill out the gaps in the game in a four hour session. You, so when you say fill out the gaps, though, let me let me kind of ask you about that. Um, does that mean you're just sort of making it up right there on the spot? I mean, of course, oh, all... not not necessarily. It just means that I haven't fleshed out. OK. The, beyond you know like like i'll have for the scenes that i create i'm gonna have dialogue that i want the npcs to say i'm gonna have descriptions of a full out descriptions of the actual locations yeah i'm gonna have motives of the npcs already planned out but then i'll jot down throughout the course of either throughout the course of the adventure or the day prior I'm, I will have, I'll just write little notes of possible scenes, but I'm not going to flesh them out with stat blocks or, or location descriptions, but we'll, I'll, I will have images. It's something that we'll, we'll talk about in a, in a little bit, mm -hmm. but that's why the images are there for to well, help me improv those elements in those scenes that I haven't prepped. Okay, yeah, and that's definitely something we're going to get into in in just a minute. Um, yeah. Is is and I was actually in. I thought this is a really interesting idea. So I actually think so. So essentially, what you're saying is that you're you the structure that you start out with when you're running a one shot is essentially a three part structure. Um, yes. You know, a beginning, uh, an end, or a climactic moment, and then of course the this the 
second act, which I guess you are calling the bridge, which I actually yeah. I like that idea. And what's interesting to me about that um, is that most stories um, about halfway through, not always, but roughly halfway through, there is some sort of reversal. Um, where the stakes are kind of raised. And I think that, like, what you were saying is that you wanted to place that aha moment, maybe the realization of the age or the realization they're on Earth or whatever it happens to be for your adventure that we that you create tonight. Um, halfway through, it's sort of a natural moment to sort of take things in another direction where the themes are maybe continued, but you go deeper into them or maybe you twist them or you do something where you there's some realization where the good guys are the bad guys and the bad guys are the good guys. That was something that Anthony had mentioned to me um, mm. when we were chatting the other night is, is this realization maybe. So who knows that might play a part in it. Um, yeah. We, we, we definitely need the PCs to feel some sort of epiphany, some sort of uh, Hey, like the game is like, I, I love games yeah. that force the players to make decisions, moral decisions. So, and this mashup is actually a game that I think is tailor made for us to like insert some morality into the game. And I haven't figured what that is, but um, hopefully, me and you will figure it out. Yeah. But we have to add some sort of moral decision. That one, I, I love playing around with the concept of morality. Period in, in games, but I think this one is gonna like lend itself. You know, this idea of this mashup is gonna lend well. Yeah. That concept. And, I, and I think one thing to remember here, and, and I think you would agree with me on this, mm. but I don't want to put any words in your mouth. Mm. I don't know about you, but when I create an adventure, I, I don't just sit down for two hours and I say, OK, I'm done. That's it. I'll, yeah. I'll write it or create it, but then I kind of sleep on it. And over a series of days or sometimes weeks or sometimes even months, I will tweak it and make changes. Um, so I think that what I want everybody maybe to know at, at home is that what we're doing is laying down the groundwork for for Anthony's game for tonight um, and that uh, we reserve the right to change everything around <laughs> after after we after we finish tonight. I, I also think that this one of the reasons why I do minimalist prep games mm -hmm. is because once again, I can only speak for myself personally. Yeah. I found personally when I over prepped, I may have good stuff, but then I become enamored with what I created on paper. Yeah. And it never and sometimes it doesn't translate well to the table. Right. And so I'll 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 be like, oh, I love this story. You know, I love these two scenes. I love this concept. And I'm less likely to change because mm -hmm. I'm I, I feel attached to it because mm -hmm. I somehow spent the time to write it. But when you when you're a, minim a minimalist prepper, right, you have no attachment to any of that. Yeah. Because, you know, like, oh, I, it's only a, a sentence I jotted down on a napkin. If I don't use it, it's no big whoop. You right. know what I mean? Like, right. I can, you know, it, it doesn't hurt me to just go in a different direction, if that makes any sense. It absolutely makes a, a lot of sense to me. Um, And so I guess at, at this point then, um. So the thing is, we're we're doing this live here right now, and I'm sort of discovering Anthony's style, even though he's sort of told me some some bits about it. Um, can you tell me, like, what is like your first step? Is it to look at those pictures first, or is it to? Yeah, but, yeah I told you this offline, and you kind of <laughs> you you thought it was funny, but the first thing I do, I'm a visual person, so if someone tells, I just grab a bunch of images. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be an image based on the concept that we're going for, but I like to grab upwards, sometimes 40, 50 images. But for this case, I think we used 15. Yeah, so, um, I, I think yeah. we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, I think we have about 18 here. So do, would yeah. you like me to go to the images then, Anthony? Do we want to start Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah, I'm a, this is a specific image that uh, I posted 10, Matt posted eight, right? Okay. And we didn't know which images we were picking, I just send Matt 10 random images. He sent me eight random images and then we compiled them together, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I I like to look at all these images before I put a pen to paper at all and, and see if I could see if something sparks my imagination or something 
and you actually posted an image on on your list that okay. I looked at it this morning and yeah. I was like, that's a cool image. Do you want I, me to start with that one? Yes. Um post a post apocalyptic image that you post apocalypse, the one of the um the one of the all the green overgrowing the yes. city. Okay, yep. so let's see if we can go to this one. Uh so we are looking at it right now and uh basically so the image is of an overgrown city. It's very dramatic. It's looking down into like the valley of of some street in some big uh capital city or something. Yeah. And what's interesting oh, so, Go ahead. I was just gonna say a little funny story. Yeah, you sent ahead. the images last night, right? Yeah. I believe it was last night or this morning. Something but something I know that I even saw it last night and this image immediately was speaking to me, right? Mm -hmm. And this morning for lunch, my, my son wanted Popeyes. So I was on my way to Popeyes and I pulled up the image again. And I was looking at this image and I said, this is our opening scene. I want a chase scene. Hmm. This this image, you know, I, I want I want there to be one, we're using cipher system, and I want to use the chase mechanics and cipher systems somehow. Yes. So I saw the image of Four people facing one person. And, and immediately in my mind, I said, okay, those are the four NPCs. Now, why are they facing off against one person? Right. Why is there this long passageway? Yeah. What is happening in this? Right. So I immediately in my mind, I said, they're either being chased or chasing someone. Okay, being chased. I'm sorry. I know you don't write things down, but I write yeah. things down. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm doing that. So they're being chased or chasing someone. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe something about being chased or chasing someone for like an opening scene as part yes. of it. Okay, cool. And, and this thing, does, this does two things. One, it immediately puts the players in the mindset, oh, okay, we're in a game. I'm in game mode. Right. I um you know I learned a long time ago the meeting in the bar and spending 20 minutes talking to each other and saying how we described that scene is filler, right? So why am I gonna start my game with filler when I could do that in you know any other part in the game? Right. I want to start the game with people grabbing dice already, going, oh right. snap. I don't know if I could curse or not. Because you can curse. Of... You can do anything you want. <laughs> All right. Oh, S word. You know, I'm going to grab my dice. I might have to start immediately going to the action. Right. And for what we're trying to do, I want to put them in an uncomfortable position as soon as the game starts. I love that. I love it because there's so many times when you get, like, here's the thing. Everybody kind of knows. And, and even though not everybody does, like, the meeting at a, at a tavern thing. Not everybody does that. But one thing that kind of irritates me about a lot of games, and, and I do it myself, is that everybody sort of knows and takes it for granted that in the first 15 or 20 minutes, no one's really playing. What's really that happening is that everybody's sort of leaning back and they're just describing who their characters are and who they're playing. Um, and, and that, to me, is just... I, I like to introduce things in a more natural way like i try to hide it but but sometimes it to various levels of success so i like the idea of starting with like in media res and we're just like going for straight out action i also like the fact that you're using the chase rules and i would like to add um i really like bruce cordell's redlining rules so you might yeah. want to use those as well those are yeah. a lot of fun like i love we did it for top valkyrie like a year or so ago with then we streamed it and like i can't tell you how much fun it was to like push the the um essentially like push like the GM intrusions up and make them more likely and, and at the expense, or I should say make success a better chance, give yourself a better chance of success at the expense of better chance of GM intrusions. Uh, I, I don't have a napkin, but I did write a little note redlining rule. So I am writing some notes. All right. All right. Do you want to go to another image? I don't, uh, we, we have this first image now, right? Yeah, so we now have it up. All right, so now, okay, we know 
I, I don't want to flesh out the first image till we get a concept. Okay. Right. Because right now we we that that just sparked the idea of how I wanted to start the game. Right. I know I I might sound like I'm going all over the place, no. but there's we actually are, a we are observing your process. This is right. this is Anthony in the wild creating a game. All right. So and I'm David Attenborough watching. <laughs> So we have we have this image now, and we know that we want to do some sort of chase thing. When we were talking about, now let's let's go back to the Logan's Run, Planet of the Apes, yeah, like th this idea. So we need to add some more elements. Mm -hmm. So it's Logan's Run, Planet of the Apes, right? Uh, Planet of the Apes is apes. It would be really lazy of us if we did apes, right? So I I saw I put animal people on on what you call it on um google google images right and the first thing that came up was a cat woman yes right and i said okay this is cool right easy to build out with cypher system right so how about if they're a race of um cats i right? then, personally i am totally fine with this so cat people so does right? this so go ahead okay I was going to say, does this mean that the two sides, like the two opposing sides, cat people versus humans? or We haven't decided that yet. Okay. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Thank you, Anthony. No. I'll just sit here in the back and I won't backseat drive anymore. No, I mean, uh, that's very possible because I see some of the images that you put up. Yeah. You know, so um, I was thinking, okay, so it's a one shot. With one shots, I like to build out pre-gens. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily to force it upon the players, mm -hmm. but to show the players a template of what I'm going for. Right. So I so in my mind, I said, OK, I'm doing Cypher system now. Now I want to use these cat people. Yeah. So in my mind, I thought, OK, there's an adept, there's a, a warrior, there's an explorer. Right. Okay. What? What um cat race or what cat ancestry or cat species would would scream warrior to me? So I thought lion. So I'll create a lion version. What cat race or ancestry or species would scream out explorer to me? I thought cheetah. And what cat race or ancestry <laughs> or or species would scream out adept to me? I thought puma. So right there, I'll narrow it down to I'm going to create three different races. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going to ask this. And mm -hmm. how important do you think it is when you're playing a one-shot to create the characters ahead of time? The pre pre Because it sounds like what you're saying is you want to pre-gen some PCs, correct? And yeah. And here's the reason why. Go ahead. Right, because Cypher System is so modular that we could actually, like literally, as I was speaking it, right, in my mind is telling me how am I gonna, what am I gonna add to make these Cypher System characters seem like these races, right? Yes. So immediately, as I said warrior, and I said lion, I said, okay, we'll craft it as a normal sentence, you pick up any, you know, descriptor, any foci, that you want to use, but anyone that's playing the lion ancestry will get plus an additional plus two to might. Okay. An asset or any strength based tasks. All right. Right. Anyone playing, anyone playing. Uh, a cheetah character is going to get an additional plus two to speed, right? An uh, asset to any um, speed-based task, mm -hmm. or, or actually trained in the skills of running and jumping. Okay. So right? let me okay. ask. Let me ask you this though. You're essentially you're very quickly creating different sort of species for, for the game, right? And you're giving the pre-gen characters uh, certain, like, bonuses over what would be standard yeah. characters. Yeah. Um, how... It'll be the same as adding power shifts to a supers game. Right. Or... Yeah. 
how how important do you think it is like how would you feel do you feel more comfortable giving your players for the one shot pre-gen characters or is it okay or or how do you feel when people bring their own characters no Are what you... i'm doing is i'm giving them the template ah got it so i would flesh out four characters right mm -hmm. and i don't care if they use them or not yeah but i'm gonna be like hey these are the, the the races that I designed, and they say someone like I noticed someone in chat put Puma, right? right? Now, if you want to come with a Puma, you have the template of okay, you get two things for your character. What are the two things, right? So it's it's all a it's all a way to like hey, it's a way of telling them hey, this is the, the direction of our story. Everyone's right. playing cat people, right? This is how you craft the cat person, right? And it takes me about 10 or 15 minutes to craft these characters. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm assuming whether they experience in Cypher or not, if they have the template, it's going to make it easier for them. Right, right. Okay, that makes so, a lot and of if sense. They, if, they use the, if they use the character, fine. If they don't, that's fine as well. Right. At least they have the template. Right. And I think it's good because what you're doing is you're giving, you're adding flavor to the game because yeah. should they choose to use these particular types of characters, um, then and when I say types, I mean the lowercase type, not like the cipher system type or whatever. But when they use a, a certain kind of character, um, it adds a feeling to to the game that is going to bring some flavor to the world. Because if you're playing that puma or you're playing that lion or you're playing whatever, at the very least, you're sort of trying to create some sort of... And and I just thought of this. Since yeah. we're doing the utopian society, yeah, right? And we, we added these additional stat bonuses and... Uh, abilities once again the puma is going to get a plus to the intellect and they're going to get the four step ability okay well right? i'm not gonna i am going to type a little bit of this in plus two to what the intellect and the four step ability and okay. and here's now here's my thought process by me just speaking this into existence yeah right now in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, what are the roles these these um different species or ancestries are playing in this society? Because now they have different attributes. So now I'm thinking, the the puma, maybe the pumas are the the you know the the pumas are the the technomancers of this world, mm -hmm. right? Maybe the the Lions are the security, or the the muscle, mm -hmm. and maybe and maybe the the cheetahs, or or scouts. Okay. So lion plus. Oh, matter of fact, too. Yeah. Let's backtrack. Instead of giving them plus two to each ability. Yeah. Let's give them. Uh, asset and intellect, defense task, might task, and speed task. Okay. Instead of giving them a fluffy, that probably makes more sense. Okay. So then I told you we were gonna we we're gonna build this from the ground up. No, like, no problem. I'm, not, I'm literally. You wanted a live thought process. This is this is Anthony. I'm I'm just trying to funnel it all down into yeah. something to put into our Google Doc. Can you actually see the doc, Anthony? Yes, I can see it. Okay, so I got Puma plus two to intellect, far step ability, technomancer, a lion plus two to might, security, muscle, but I missed the ability that you wanted to add to the lion. Uh the oh the lion has um oh uh might might based tasks. We could um strength but yeah might based tasks. Mm -hmm. And that would include all might based tasks. Okay. So that would be lifting or breaking stuff. And this is a quick and dirty way of just, you know, when I always hear people like, oh, how do I build this out? If you're, you're running a one, one shot, yeah. my suggestion is always go the minimalist route. Yeah. And if the game progresses, then you can start thinking about, okay, the more, is this broken more detail, out? Does this like make if it sense? Goes... And make changes. Right. I always feel like people tend to think because they wrote, wrote something down mm -hmm. that is etched in stone and that no one possesses an eraser. You know, like if it doesn't work the first time you, you know, the first time we run it, 
it's okay to be like, hey guys, that was broken or that was a little weak. Let, let's tweak it a bit, you know, to fix our concept. And I think I think the truth is like any one shot is usually going to be it's almost like a pilot episode of a TV show. Like yeah. you you rarely see like the second episode of any show the the show being exactly the same as the first episode because they decide some stuff worked some stuff didn't and and even like over seasons you see changes in that so mm-hmm. i think that it's fine to i i like your idea of just you know having fun with it the first way try it really simply and then you go in for like a finer kind of look a little bit later so yeah. these are going to be kind of like your your base classes or your base yes yeah. Okay, so then what would you like to do next, Anthony? Once that we have we have the basics of these three types here, um, Puma, you were saying being adept, Lion being a warrior, uh, Cheetah being an explorer. Um, yes. What would you like to do next? We you started with your first image. All right, and now I now I'm gonna go back to the the totality of all the images, right? Mm-hmm. And I jot, I just jot down emotions I get from not individual images but the all the images we have as a whole right and this is what i wrote down like just by looking at these images 10 minutes before we went live right can you give us a name so i can pull them up no i i was looking at all the images together oh okay got it right i wrote down the awakening and that i think that goes with the concept of like some sort of epiphany, right? I wrote down pheromones. Don't ask me why. It just no problem. Like... I don't know how to spell I... pheromones, yeah. but I'll try. I... Go ahead. I wrote down Chronicles of Abraham. I just thought it sounded cool. Yeah. I wrote down Utopian Society. Oh, wow. You don't have to write this down, but I wrote down Advanced Technology. Yeah. Cybernetics. Okay. And aha moment. Aha moment. Like it. And and I said, okay, I'm gonna try to incorporate just these initial thoughts. I love the concept of invoking those initial emotions and feelings you get, writing it down quickly and seeing if it if I could go back to it when we're crafting the story and I can make it fit. Got it. I like it, though. I like this because it kind of like it's sort of like an association game. So yes. if you kind of take all of these things, you can kind of rearrange them. And to be honest, yes. like right off the bat, I'm not going to tell you what I see because I don't want to influence this too much. But like I can kind of see a story kind of coming out of this. It's like a Rorschach <laughs> test or, or yeah. something. Um, OK, so I mean, that's the plan, I guess. Mm hmm. All right. Yeah. So if we're starting out, we're starting out with a chase sequence. Uh, we have three different classes or types. Um, mm-hmm. You have some images, or so I should say, some image words that came out of yeah. all of the images. Where would you like to go next, Anthony? What would you like? All to right. Do? So now we're gonna go back. Now we know that we have these three cat-like species, mm-hmm. and they somehow like. There's a reason for them being together, right? Yeah. Take the image of Dome City. Yeah, got it. Yep. And that goes with what I wrote down as an utopian society. So there's a reason why all these cat-like races are living in this perfect world. And it made me think of maybe they're here to protect this world. And it doesn't have to be, I know in the image there's a dome with like mountains, but that's not what, I'm just looking at it, the image for the emotion of, or the thought process, that there is this city that is surrounded by waste and destruction and and it's perfect inside this city, right? And if you lived in a society like that, you would obviously want to keep it that way. So perhaps our players are are in charge or part of an organization that's designed to keep it that way. Mm -hmm. So now what is threatening this city, right? To make make them wanna 
have to have an organization designed to keep it, keep it that way. Okay, right? I see this. So that's now that, that's the thought process. Now the name of this city or or any of that stuff we haven't thought of yet. But we know that they part of the society that's designed to oh shit, let me just go this up real quick. Well, let me so ask I, you this, Anthony. If if the members of this utopian society that are in the dome city are mm -hmm. they're cat people, correct? Yes. So is it possible that the people outside the walls are humans? Can I how about can I throw something about, out? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I don't well I don't want to sort of interrupt or steer your process too much, but No, that's why we're having this discussion. Is if, to go back. if they are, then I mean the way that I if if that's what it is, and they're cat people, um then the re and if the humans are outside the walls, I mean it sounds like this is a post apocalypse. And the humans have maybe wrecked. How, how about if we go a step further? Okay. Because human could be our aha moment. Oh. How about, how about if we go to mutated person? Okay. I know I, I posted a picture of a mutant before. Yeah, let me see if I can call that up. I think the one that you sent me was a little bit too small. Oh, okay. So what I ended up doing was... I went with one that was a little bit... I went with more of a zombie than a mutant. I don't know if you can see this at all. Oh, yeah. I see the fantasy zombie. Yes. Um, but it's not quite the one that you had you had posted. But it does at least stand in for the idea yeah. of some sort of a mutant. So are you so saying... How, mm -hmm. uh, how about if they... Or how about this? How, how about the city itself yeah. And it goes inside with the pheromones. The city itself is producing some sort of toxin outside that's turning humans into mutants. Okay. And so the, how about this? What yeah. if the city, in order to stay a utopia, is using generators that are doing that? Yeah, it's pumping. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's ah. pumping some sort, sort of... um. Whatever is toxic to the city is pumping it outside of the city, and it's it's turning the humans that are outside of the city into some sort of mutated beast that doesn't look anything like a human. So it could be a stand-in zombie. It could be I, I put a picture of the fly. Yeah, remember the whole thing. It could be something like that. Yes, uh, yes, Brundlefly, I would like to add, designed by Chris Wayless, actually, <laughs> a, a very fantastic and amazing science fiction, or I should say, uh, visual effects creature builder. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, okay, so the city itself is producing some kind of toxic element that is being pumped to the outside, pumped to the outside of the city, turning humans or whatever into some kind of mutated or zombie-like creature. All right, and I just Googled while we were talking when I said old oh, S word, I have to Google something. Yeah. The average age, according to Google, of a standard house cat yeah. is 16 years old. Yes. Something like How that. How about now, now oh. let's incorporate Logan's run. Oh. So these cat people go through something called the awakening, which is what I wrote down, at 16, which allows them to go past their normal, the normal age of a, a cat race, right? And that procedure, right, you deemed worthy, if you're worthy to the pack, to the society, they allow you to live beyond 16. If you if they do not see you as worthy, you age out and die at 16. And that process is what's creating the toxin that they have to spill out into the Oh okay. I get it. I don't know if it makes any sense because I just thought of it right it's now. A, it's a one shot, Anthony. 
it makes <laughs> lots of sense. It only has to make sense for about four, four hours, hours to three and a half, because if you get engaged in some great action sequence, you're not even going to be thinking about it. So you just need to make it make sense for about three and a half hours or so, and that'll do yeah. it. Okay, so the cat people living inside this dome go through some sort of an awakening at 16, which allows them to go past their average age. Should they be deemed worthy, they're allowed to age past 16. This process is what creates a toxic environment. And all, all our characters are 15 and a half. Okay. Oh, we can even actually split it up. We can have... We can actually, oh no, we can roll before the game starts mm -hmm. that someone, one of the PCs is a day before 16. Oh, that is actually really, well, wait a minute. Yes. What if, and here's the thing though. If only one of the characters is the day before 16, we might not get everyone motivated. What if? No, but here, here's the thing though. We'll have our aha moment, and they have to decide. Remember, it's all about giving choices. Hmm. So we don't want to pigeonhole everyone and be, oh, I have no choice. Hmm. But if we pin it on one character, now it's up to the character to convince the others. You right. Know, well, so we... here's what I'm thinking, though. In order to motivate, so if we have, are you going to have three characters, three PCs? Oh, four. Four? four. Okay. Yeah. So you have one that's aging out. Tomorrow, mm -hmm. we have another that's either like a litter mate, like a brother mm -hmm. or sister, so that adds extra motivation, I, I, or girlfriend or boyfriend, a yeah, mate somehow, right? So that automatically gets two people that are going to probably go for this. And, and then, then we have to add a 10 year old, though. Uh, we have to add that one person that's right, young. someone that's it's so far away, and maybe they still yeah. believe in it, and they're a best buddy or a best friend or something, or they're yeah. a tag along, like a little sister or, or a little brother. And then the other two, so we automatically have two that are going to kind of like want to go. So that actually yeah. makes it a little bit easier for them to persuade the other two, right? Yes. And then so these other two are, are like you said, maybe one of them is a 10-year-old, impressionable. Maybe they look up to the other two, but maybe they also look up to this other one that's more cynical and maybe doesn't, or, or is more believing. So I don't know. But I, I like this idea. Okay, so we have... We have these possible four characters. We have the dome. Um, we have uh, the idea that this awakening process is actually going to, it, it, it uh, pollutes the outside of the world. And they don't know this, I assume. No. So now we have elements here. We have a chase sequence. But how is this coming together, Anthony? Help us. Help us. What's our next step? What are we looking to do? All right, so now that we have a basic idea of what whatever the society is called, right? We we know that they have an aging process, and we will we have to make it seem maybe we need to add an NPC or better yet, an intercom connected to the players, explaining to them that this is these two characters deem worthy gotcha. if they accomplish whatever this mission is and that's how we explain the whole awakening in the opening scene by this npc explaining hey if you don't come back with this kill or whatever it is Which, then this oh, is, this is good because i was just going to say uh we have a fellow i don't know if he's from cypher unlimited or i don't know if he's actually from my channel or he's just some random fellow i have john lamb in the chat and John Hello, is saying, John. oh, okay, so you know John. Do you know him? Is he from Cypher Unlimited? Uh, I'm not sure if John's in the Cypher Unlimited, but I do know he's active in the Cypher community. Oh, cool. Okay. So he is saying, his, his idea was, what if the characters are all on their last patrol before the Awakening, and they're asking themselves, like, should I, should I go back? And here's the thing, like, if they're on their last patrol then this kind of like creates a scene or, or maybe a, a situation in which what you were saying about they have intercoms where they're connected to some other, maybe there's yeah. some person like telling them, a person, some cat person, some leader that's saying, okay, you're out doing this uh, and you should be doing this and we're tracking you. And then at a certain point, maybe after they have these problems, 
the the as they're tracking them they can say look you're going in the wrong direction what are you doing are you going the right way and they can kind of like that's how the people or the cat people learn that these guys have gone rogue these characters have gone rogue and they send someone to chase them i don't know i'm just throwing that out there that was the, from the John's. reason why i don't want to i don't want to i want the rogue decision to be on the players i don't want to force it upon them you know like that that decision has to be decided by the players yeah because i want to make it open enough that if they want to just you know, if they want to be the opposite of Logan's run and follow through to the end, that's their choice. Right. But what we can do when you were saying is, how about that in order th they go out to hunt these mutants outside of the utopian society because there's something in the genes of the mutants that they use to create whatever serum for the awakening to extend the lives. So they actually have to go out and capture some mutants. Okay. This this makes some sense. And how about this could be the bridge scene though. How about they find a human unmutated baby that doesn't look like a mutant but looks like a human baby. Oh, and it's just so pure and so cute that they they can't take its genetic material. Yes. And that's what sort of possibly causes them to sort of question this whole thing. Correct. Never thought I'd be using the word harvest with the <laughs> word baby, but there you go. They don't have the heart to harvest. Harvest it for their purposes. Yeah, I like John's idea because it's very Logan's runnish about they meet an old cat character that's beyond 16, but it's feral. Like it walks on all fours. And that, would that be a character like out in the mutant world? Out yes. Outside the dome? Like, like maybe like, 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 and we'll play it up that they, um, you know, it's more cat than like a bipedal. Right. You know? Right. But yeah. it still yeah. has some, like it could talk, you know, it yeah. just, when they said you aged out, what they probably mean, oh, that could be our aha moment. Okay. Your age out doesn't mean that you die. It means you go back to a normal cat. Oh, all right. And you regress. And yeah. maybe somehow, could it be, let me ask you this though. This is makes things really, really complicated here. I love this, by the way, because this, this is really my thought process. This is good. <laughs> what if I, I just hope the viewers can keep up with us because yeah. I, I'm keeping up with this, but I, I don't know if they can, but I, I think they can. Yeah. What if. Well, thank you, John. That was a great suggestion. I, I like John's suggestions, actually. So yeah. what if the aging out process is that they start to they regress or what if they're sent out into into the mutant world and they slowly regress. So when they're going out into the world, what's really happened is that this old cat is, this is what happens to cats after six or seven years. Like maybe the cats live longer now, they, they're 22. And, but the, the just price, become normal, yes, normal the price cat. is that they're slowly regressing back to being a normal cat. And maybe they're trying to, maybe this older cat is trying to convince them this is really the way it should be, or you know this is what? the way that nature intended it to be. I, I know I'm scatterbrained all over the place, Fine. but that's where Chronicles of Abraham come in. Oh, they view this book as the Chronicles of Abraham, like it's just some sort of religious tech yeah. text. Yeah, but it's actually Abraham, Doctor Abraham. Uh, let's for. Well, I'll use are uh, they Levi's. discovering are they discovering this text outside the dome or inside the dome? No, I'm just coming up with the concept now. We'll figure that out as we go <laughs> I like it. But, okay. Well let's just let's But just is do Dr. It. Abraham Livingstones? He was the he was a human scientist that actually created this whole process of turning cats into humanoid figures, you know, before whatever apocalypse happened to the earth. 
So he's actually he's like the Terminator guy that started the apocalypse. With... Yes, uh, I forget the the character's name. Miles Dyson, right? Yeah, but the cat races view his like scientific text as biblical, like a biblical artifact. And that's why they call it the Chronicles of um, Abraham. And maybe for the finale, they have to go back into the go dome to get this text to prove to everyone that this is all a sham. Oh, wait a minute. So, okay, so let me, okay. So these these texts exist only in legend. Yeah. And they realize, my goodness, these are actual scientific texts and there's a scientific facility like outside and maybe the dome was somehow created by yes. Dr. Dr. Abraham, Dr. Livingstone. And maybe yeah. it feels like it's huge, right? Cause we're all like, everyone's thinking it's huge. We're thinking these cats are like the size of humans or whatever, but it's, it's large, but maybe it's like the size of a football field or something or two football yeah. fields. And it's actually just an environment that's that's modifying these cats and right next to it like the building next to it mm -hmm. is is the science facility where the research facility where this takes place and the aha moment it sounds like what you're saying and i think i'm starting to see this really clearly is maybe when they discover oh we're actually only like a foot and a half tall there are humans <laughs> that are like six feet tall mutated and it's not our world and when they try to go into the scientific facility the doors are six feet tall and they have they can barely like reach them and then the books are like this bigger than they are almost and they have to carry them yeah, around. that's awesome like yeah, that's they, an awesome they idea. think like and and maybe the pcs and we could hide it from the the players right we don't tell the players because they're probably thinking in their heads like oh D, D tabaxi they're like five feet tall and everything oh, and the human the human baby could be huge to them right that's probably like the aha moment yeah. where they, they see something like, or they, something's huge, something giant, the size of them is moving around in the bushes and they, they hear like yeah. a scream and the scream yeah. is really just a baby crying and it comes tumbling out. Yeah. Maybe they won't be so small, but we'll say we'll give them the size of whatever the biggest, uh, like a bobcat size. So they're about three feet tall. Okay. Y you know, but essentially so they're, not... they're learning that they're a different, they're not quite, the world isn't quite what they thought. Yeah. Like they're a little bit yeah, smaller. That's, a, that's actually an awesome idea. Yeah. 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 I, see, we got a story shaping I up. Think so. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think this works. So, uh, so Game Master, what is our next, what's our next step in this case then? All right. So now let's go back to the opening scene because I think we have a good idea. We have a good fleshed idea of what. Like I in my head, I I sort of have what a bridge scene is going to be. So now let's flesh out the opening scene. The, we we now know why they're out there, mm -hmm. right? We now know that they're out there to hunt mutants, and which is dangerous because these mutants are, are, are oversized, or in their eyes, these massive creatures, but they're really average size mutated humans. But in their eyes, they're like hunting dinosaurs. Can I ask? Can I ask yeah. one little question? Yeah. What if, so there's a huge dome, there's a there's a factory-like research facility that's just sort of running on automatic pilot because the apocalypse has happened and- you know, And the factory thing is what's pumping out the toxin that's well, creating- I was gonna thing. add, right. And that's what John was saying kind of like in the chat. He was saying like, yeah. oh, well maybe these pheromones that they're pumping and creating or what are turning, having this process causing it to happen. But what if it's this? I don't know how you feel about this. What if they actually have to go out to like reset something on the computer, like hit a button or change a change like a cylinder or change something? Yeah, we could give them an assignment, but I, I I like the idea that they have no significance in they're not part of the the process of having it happen. Okay. Yeah. Because, because yeah. if they are part of the process, it's going to be real easy for them to figure out the aha moment. Right. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. You're right. Good point. No, All right. So I, I'm sorry. I, Go ahead. The, you know, I, I, that's why I want them to have mundane, you know, like, 
like you know, it's like just take Star Wars as an example. If we're using Star Wars, you know, that story would have played out a lot differently if Luke wasn't, you know, entirely unknown. If he right, actually knew, if he knew know, he was Vader's son, yeah, yeah. We we don't want to give them because then what what's going to happen in Cypher System is you're going to have someone go. Oh, if I if I'm familiar with how to fix this, can I do a intelligence role to see where exactly these wires are leading to? Right. Right. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. And we try to avoid that. Yeah. Okay. Makes total sense. I like the fact of creating like a firewall between like knowledge of what's going on and, and what the, the cats, what the, this race of cats is sort of like doing. So that's, that's yeah, I think, a really we, good idea. We, yeah, because we kind of want to give the impression, right, that if they succeed this, the two people that are, are going to live past 16 and are not going to be released into the wild. And if they have knowledge of the whole inner workings of way, then we don't have a big bad. You know, we want them to right. be the, we want them to be the infiltrators back into this dome society. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't know if that makes any sense. It but absolutely like, makes sense. I totally get where you're going. What do you want to do that's next? That's why I kind of like the idea of they going out to hunt these mutations, bring one back. And that's part of the awakening. Like, if you succeed on this, you know, we will deem you worthy to the pack and we will allow you to live past 16. And I like the idea that we settled on, not necessarily, it's really a myth of living to succeed. What they mean is they just throw you out outside of this so, dome and you become a cat. That's it. You Yeah, you fend for yourself and you slowly regress back. Because... We can even state that once someone they lock someone in a room once they turn 16 and no one in the pack ever sees them again. Right. So the assumption is that they die. But right. But nobody no one really, really knows. knows. Yes. And that gives us that Logan's run kind of ticking out. clock, yeah. like gotta go out there and yeah. Okay. All right. So then what's the next step, Anthony? What are we we so gonna, gonna do that first scene? Yeah, so now we're going to go to the first scene, and in the first scene, we actually, we're going to lead off with a chase scene, with, and we'll we'll bring in some mutated, you, so now we know it's going to be three times the size, so now I have an idea how I could flesh out the, this action scene, and, we'll, and now it makes sense that we can have the four of them chasing one mutated creature, mm -hmm. and at the end of this conflict, whether they kill it or it escapes, we we find a human baby. Okay, let me let me call this up then. So I'm gonna start kind of sketching this out. Mm -hmm. So we'll to start us off. I'll just say, or at least to sort of describe the scene. I'm gonna say like our four heroes are chasing a mutant creature mm -hmm. uh, through the uh, post apocalyptic. Let's see if I can. Forests, is it forests? Is it city? Is it overgrown city? I, I think it's. I like the idea of overgrown city. Okay. Because overgrown. here's what I, what I and you know I'm a, I'm a northeast guy, so we're gonna say that it's the island of Manhattan. Okay. And they chase him into. The subway system. Oh. And here's where we'll introduce the human resistance. Oh. Where did that come from? Was that just some idea suddenly you had? That's good. Yeah, this just something that came up. And here's now go to your Android and baby image. Okay, hold on one second. Go to the Android and baby. Uh, got it. Boom. All right, I'm gonna loosely use this Android and baby image for what my concept is. Mm -hmm. Or what I'm thinking. Okay. Oh, is the image up? Yep, it's up. All right, the Android, the humans that survive wear some sort of like a uh, air mask. You know, to prevent the from the mutation. So there'll be some sort of resistance, and I 
Like I see that I know it's an android in this image, but it's actually just a human in like a mech suit. No, I get it. I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. The whole idea is that the image is just inspiring the idea. Yes. It's not literally the idea because we're taking the images. You're taking the images first and then turning them into the story. So could it So if they if the if the cats chase the the mutant creature now wait a minute are they chasing a mutant human that kind of communicates or is no this... they're chasing a, a mutant human like a deformed doesn't look anything human okay and then they chase right. it into the subway and then what could happen here like the humans end up killing it themselves or the cats kill it and then they're left realizing that they're in the secret human like lair Resistance lair or oh the 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 mutated human has the baby and it's gonna eat it oh. or, or do something so the mute the mutated humans are a threat to both the regular humans and the cat people okay and the reason why this dome city they patrol outside is because the mutated humans are starving for food that they've been attacking the dome we could say for years. And every once in a while, you know, you, they have to send send out um like patrols to clear up the area. You know what I mean of of these mutated creatures. Got it. Got it. So then, that means they're either going to have to kill the creature so that it drops the baby, or just in general get the baby from it. No, that's going to create the conflict. Mm -hmm. We. We have to end the scene somehow, some way, with our heroes having possession of the human baby. Baby. Okay. And this human resistance squad wanting to retrieve the baby. So now oh. it's going to give us. It's going to give us an opportunity to form a scene where they have to interact with each other. Whether it's conflict or negotiation will be up to the players. But we're putting them in a position to make a decision. Okay. Oh, I love this. I like this a lot. Also, since it's New York City, yeah. we could have we could play up the NPCs as all the cat people speak with a heavy Bronx accent. <laughs> Wait a minute. And they go, Bronx and, or Manhattan or Brooklyn or Queens? No, we'll say Bronx. Okay. Because, you know, Bronx and Manhattan are closely connected. Yeah, and it's easy okay. to represent. And the reason why they speak in that accent is because that's the accent that the Book of Abraham, Doctor, whatever, is the accent he had. Got it. And it's also... It's going to be like, why are these NPCs speaking this way? You know, it's like adding a little thing. I like that. It's like a little detail that's kind of like a mystery, but it also sort of fleshes out a lot of the... It, it gives, like, the, the character's character. It gives the scene yes. character, and it gives it, you know... I don't know if I can And do... it's like, why are these NPC, these cat NPCs talking with a heavy New York accent? That would or, be you know, so... Oh, wait a minute. So it's the... Okay, I got it. The cats. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. All right. <laughs> the cats are Yankees fans. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, wait a minute. Maybe the cats have a Boston accent and the, oh. the human resistance <laughs> has a Bronx accent because they're a Bostonian scientist. I don't know. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> this sounds good. I, I like this. All right. So we've got a we've got like a scene one here. I hope you like it. <laughs> what are we what are we thinking do we want to so let me ask you this anthony so we have i love this idea we have a concept we have a first mm -hmm. scene we have this uh this conflict where essentially it sounds like the 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 hook or the start of all of this is going to be the retrieval of that baby um yes. and what they're going to be sort of doing with it so what what is our next step? Are we going to be laying out the next couple scenes, like your bridge, and then your yeah. end, or are you going to? Yeah, no, yeah. Now we're going to go before we do the bridge. Yeah. Let's. I'm. I'm sorry. Let's go to the end. Okay. Let's go figure to the... out 
I like this. All right, this is no problem. Can you? Can I ask because you? Now, now that we know how we starting and how the the where we going, like where the the initial conflict is going to be, it's going to start with this chase scene. Perhaps some sort of um confrontation with this mutated, you know, a mutated human somehow. Yeah. We'll figure out how how this mutation is going to look because I want to the description of the mutation not lead you to think that it's human in any kind. So we're going to have to like uh, figure out and with cyber system, it's easy to grab a creature or whatever and we'll figure it out. You know, uh, uh, you know, adapt it that way, but we could do that offline. Yeah. But we know what, we know what the conflict is. The, the basic concept. And I like this idea. So let me, let me ask you this just for a little bit more clarification. I, I actually am kind of similar. Sometimes when I'm building a story, I, I kind of see a vision, and I usually see the strongest part of the story first, and that's often for me the beginning or the end. Um, yeah. you, and and let me ask you, when you are creating your stories, your your adventures, do you typically go from opening scene to ending, and then you kind of put the bridge in later, or usually, believe it or not, I I usually um flesh out the ending. <laughs> First. Like like I, I know what the like the how I want like I most of the time I'll be like yo this would be a cool final boss fight or yeah or a cool ending scene and then I work backwards but I do tend to do the beginning and the end in whatever order and the bridge I do once I know what the beginning and the end is the bridge is easy for me right because now right. I'll be like how am I going to connect these two and what's the easiest route of doing that okay but since since we were just talking back and forth and since like I literally wanted to come in with an open idea, like I didn't start thinking about this until I was going to yes. a Popeye's today. I was like, <laughs> let me let me get a little thought. But like, I really I like the idea of, of us just building. Yeah, this exactly. Show. That's what the whole purpose of the show. Yeah. Yep. yep. So, so you know, normally I would put a little more thought process before I started actually crafting for this exercise. I decided not to do any of that. And I literally concentrated on those images, you know, for those 20 minutes. Totally, was... totally works for me. So do you want to, do you want to sort of help me understand then? Do we, are we jumping to the final scene, the third scene now? Or... Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So now, okay. We know that there's some sort of conflict between humans on the outside. We know that something about this dome is create, is turning humans into this mutated beast, right? So my question for you and for me is do the cat people know that this is happening? The cat people is on the inside a, of the dome? Yeah, is there a, is this an accident? Cuz cuz that would dictate how our end scene is. Here's what I think. I like the idea of what um John had said earlier and here's the way I see it. What if those four creature the the four cats were out on patrol and it somehow they're on their last patrol or whatever it is and you had mentioned the idea of the intercom or a commu some sort of radio right yeah. let's say the cats go outside the dome to harvest the human hmm. they end up the, mu the mutant yeah. to, ch to yeah. harvest a mutant they end up chasing the mutant and the mutant has a baby they get the baby now at this point there's a conflict happening, right? Because they meet the resistance, the human resistance. Yeah, I want to emphasize that we've never, the cat people have never seen humans. So they're shocked like, by this. Now, yeah, there's never talk of like anything about humans. Here's what yeah. I see. Because that if, brings the planet of the apes. If atmosphere. they go out yeah. on a patrol, chances are maybe there's some sort of tracking devices. And now that the home base knows that they've got the baby or they've got the. The genetic material from the mutant or whatever they expect the cats to come back mm. the cats don't come back so they think a couple things they think either for some reason the cats are killed or something has happened and they can't return or maybe there's some other little clue in which they realize the cats actually have realized that something weird is going on and they've gone rogue so 
the way that I see but it is. I, you see, I, I I know you lead it, but you viewed it in the lens of the player. I I personally I I always try to avoid that. Like I don't want to assume the players are going to make any decisions like that. But some way or another, yeah. the cats are going to stay outside the dome, right? No, see that's the thing. When uh... we the end scene, we we can't assume that. Yeah. Because. We we want we want to give them the option that we want to make our ending scene as flexible as possible, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> so we want to make it to give them the option of if they go back to the dome city, they our ending scene is still valid. If they if they go, mm -hmm. if they go, if the ending scene has to be valid either way. Okay. So we can't handicap ourselves by. I get forcing it. Our, our mind to think but, that they go because okay, it's, so, it's about building a railroad yeah. without letting them see the rail. So then, here's the other thing. Mm. There could be a piece of knowledge probably the cats have learned from going outside or from taking an object or from doing either one of those things and staying outside or going inside. Either way, the cats have new knowledge of what's going yeah, on. Yeah, that's in the, the world. bridge. So that new knowledge, that new knowledge would be the bridge. The, the end scene is how we're gonna end it. There's a secret society that sit above that know what's going on and don't want anyone else to know. So they send a group mm. after the cats to get them. So it is the cats. Or or you think that there's a secret society Well what I was trying to get at is that both the here's the end. This is what I see. I, and, I, and I got it. I got it. Manhattan itself, the rest of the world is fine. Yeah. This is just an experiment that's happening on Manhattan Island. Whoa, wait. So hold on. This is really good. So what the twist halfway through is that they're in a yeah. dome and they're like, oh my goodness, we're in a dome and it, we're actually, the they're whole in world a dome, is an apocalypse, but there's another dome outside of the first dome. Yes. And then another dome around the earth and they're, <laughs> so the they're twist aliens is, controlling the so planet. The yeah, so the twist is, right, yeah. that th both sides are duped. You know, so oh outside, my gosh. Of, outside of Manhattan, yes. the world is fine. It's run by humans. It's normal. You know, everything is fine. And this whole place is like a snow globe, like a, a zoo, right? Yeah. And the humans that are in there are criminals that yeah. they send in, right? So... So it's sort of like, and these mutated cat people. So then the criminals, so when the cats go outside the dome, the people that they meet, even the, the, the ones that are still human, actually are all like this patchwork group of humans who are all criminal-esque, and they're kind of yeah. mean and nasty, yeah. or, I mean, just a stereotype here, but they're, they're not the sort of people that you would expect to find as a as a cross-section of a, the United States. No, but it's like Australia. Maybe originally that was the case, but this has been going on for like 100 years. So, you know, those people develop so into normal... We have, like, you know, we have Logan's Run, we have Planet of the Apes, and Escape from New York. Yeah, and John had su uh, suggested the Warriors as well, and I see the yeah. Warriors in this as well. So. I've I, I've actually run the Warriors many times. That's yes. like one of my favorite. <laughs> I love it. I wanted to do a yeah. stream, but that's yeah. something different. So yeah. then, what's our step? Then what's our scene three? What's that going to be? All right. So our I don't scene want to tell three, you. You tell me. Our scene three is no matter what the decision that happens. Here's where now go to image. Yeah. Which image? Go to two images. Yeah. Go go to Android. Yep. Android is up. Mm -hmm. And the other image I want you to go to is Cryotex. All right. Android and Cryotex. They they're both. So all big baddies. Now, no matter what, is we the players are somehow going to find this information, right? And the androids are like, you you effing up this TV show, you effing up this experiment, so we got to wipe out both the humans and the cat. Not the dome, but the NPCs, I mean, the player characters themselves, 
and the humans, whether they decided to join them or fight them. And the end scene is this regiment of androids coming in to wipe out that whole. And now these are the androids that are outside the outside dome. Yes. Because they're they monitoring set, everything going on inside. Yeah, they have to send in androids because if they send in humans, they're gonna they could get affected by the the pathogen. Oh you know, right. Mutated. Okay. Oh, I like this. So no matter what happens, now does this this means though that if the cats the PCs decide to go back inside the dome. The androids go inside the first dome. Then they go inside the cat dome. L yeah. Let me ask well, you once this. Once again, it's open. Now, now that remember what I said at the very beginning of the game, right? I like to force decisions on the players. Right. So now that's hey, we now there's that, that decision. We have to go tell our, our fellow cat people this is all BS, and you know. Um, we're supposed to, you know, we're not supposed to be like, we're just a plaything. We're just an experiment. Right. Right. So the one, it could create a hella cool scene where the players convince all the cat to wage war against these androids. Right. You, you know, or it, they could say, hey, the player characters could be like, we want to protect them and keep them naive. We'll sacrifice ourselves to the androids so our friends and family mm. won't die. So you know, sometimes, sometimes it's better to be naive than dead. And here's you know the cool I mean? thing: if the androids go into the dome outside the dome, mm -hmm. they're human-like. If they go into the dome within the dome, they're cat-like androids because yes. they've got to be smaller to fit inside the smaller dome. Well, I guess if it's yes. the size of a football field, they could probably still get in there. But either way, you see, I don't even think it's the size of a football field. It'll, you think it's smaller, bigger? Oh, big. Okay. More. Like we gotta assume that you know, cause it's we we gotta assume that it's maybe the size of like a three or four block radius. Or could it be Central it's Park Manhattan. in Manhattan? Yeah, yeah, it could be Central Park. In or Manhattan. like, yeah, because we want we want to in the beginning of the game we want to remember we want to play on the idea that they're not, we're not really smaller than humans. So we gotta have this like they have schools, they have you know they have kids, you know training skills. They have hospitals. They have, you know, so it's a big, big area. Okay. Do we want to do anything more for scene three then? What are any of the, what are some of the other things that you're hoping will happen at the end then to sort of wrap it up? Or will you sort of decide that once we do a bridge? No, um, as in the, the scene three is going to have to have, right? And uh, we have to, Flesh out android thing, yeah. uh, android regiment. What's that look like statistically? Yeah. You know, like what are those fleshed out stats are going to be for these, for these uh, creatures? What kind of weapons they have? Yeah. Well, right? now since we came up with this concept, we got to flesh out what this second dome looks like, mm -hmm. right? All right. And now we go back to the Chronicles of Abraham. Abraham yeah. is actually the guy that created this whole experiment. So he's the big bad. He's the one that sends in the androids when he realizes that his experiment, you know, is, is wrong. So the chronicles of Abraham are actually the 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 humans have now now we'll go to the bridge. The humans have the chronicles of Abraham. They have the book, which in the bridge gives to the, the PC characters. And it's going to be an address outside of Manhattan. So they have we, to go outside the dome? No, it's going to have an address outside the dome where none of the it'll look like a foreign language to the players. Like they won't know exactly what it is. All right. Oh, actually, yeah. Pull up the image of Cyberdome. Yeah. Let me do that. Cyberdome. Let me put it up. Where's Cyberdome? Because we do have a Cyberdog in image. There we go. Cyberdog. If they go oh. into the if they go into the dome, those are the androids that go in. Oh, that is particularly scary. Dome. 
this actually goes back to what John's been like saying repeatedly as he keeps talking about dogs. I like this idea. Mm -hmm. So it's a cyber dog. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So that's what our, that is what our androids look like, which is particularly, yes. it's, it's a good simple image to kind of like, you know, so the PCs have a shortcut way of knowing these are the bad guys or these are the adversaries. But if, if, if the NC outside the dome, right, then we go with the big androids because they assuming that they're going to kill the humanoids that are in there. If the end, if the end scene goes in the dome, then we go with the cyber dome. Okay. All right. That makes a lot of sense to me. So do we, at this point, do we want to go with the bridge scene? Yes. Not, all right. Now that we are how we're going to end the game and we will we'll leave the, the, you know, that is Dr. Abraham Livingston. And this is all his concocted experiment. And it could be for, I mean, we haven't decided yet, but it, it could be done as a punishment to humans and as a television show or something of that the entertainment for people outside of this dome, right? Or a scientific experiment, you know, either way, we, we haven't is, come up with that. It's all of that this like, go, is this being broadcast outside the dome? To like for yeah, people we to could, watch. We could, we could do that as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay, got it. Now let's go to the bridge. Yes. So that's what I kind of wanted to ask. I'd like to hear about how you create your bridge based on these. The first, you've got your you've got your opening, you've got your closing, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, the basic idea of it. Now, how do you create your, your bridge? You're going to have to have these two things sort of merge together. So what are you going to do? Okay, now the bridge is, we know that we want to have this humanoid baby, and we, in the, which is going to, it, it feeds off the first scene. The first scene is the chase scene, chasing the mutated. Somehow, we're going to bridge into the conflict. To me, the conflict, the bridge is going to be the, Humanoids, first uh, the humanoids meeting the cat people, right? The humanoids attacking for the the return return of this baby, right? The humanoids having the information of the Chronicles of Abraham, right? And since it's been a hundred years or hundred and fifty years, this experiment has been going on, right? Yeah. We'll have. The old, we're going to have an old human that was either alive or was born fresh during when this experiment started. And we're going to have, I like what they said in chat, we're going to have cats that are fully feral and we will have <clears throat> either like the cat itself either having like a badge or something indicating that they word similar to the players. Uh, I don't know how we, you know, so this bridge scene is going to allow them to decide, okay, this is all bullshit that's happening inside this dome. Do we go back and tell them or do we try to escape? Let me, let me ask you this though. Could it be that the thing that shows RPCs that this is what happens is not that there's just one cat, but there are multiple cats and they're at different stages. And what's funny is the older they are, the more like a feral cat they are. So the the old man cat is sort of half. Oh, you know, you know how we do that in game form? Because I, I like that idea. I just don't like giving it to them all at one time. Mm -hmm. How we do that in game form mm -hmm. is, remember when I talked about we write little notes on the bridges in between scenes? Yeah. We, we can have a scene just in passing with a GM intrusion that we they see off in the distance, a cat walking on two feet and then jumping, grabbing onto a tree on all fours and leaps away. So that way they oh. don't see, you know, like, I, I don't like giving them all the information at one time. It's a clue. So if they want to investigate that further, remember what I said about mm -hmm. giving them scenes in, in order for them directions to go in their own direction? Mm -hmm. Then they can investigate that further. Right. But in the final scene, they'll see the full-on 
the whole you know, like, thing. I don't want to give them in stages in front of them. Yeah. Right. You know, like, we want to build that. So, but what we did do is I'll write a little note saying, show the, show the, the actual, like, the actual line at, you know, as it, it's sort of like, um, you know, like the, like it's the, the way it's morphing into, you know, back into a normal cat. Let's, let's just throw in little scenes so we could see. So there are kind of hints at this, there are hints at this happening, but they, they're not quite, they don't quite make sense until we really like pay off uh, their understanding of what's going on. Yeah, because if we show them to them all at once, it's sort of like, oh, it's not an aha, it's more like, oh, okay, you're just giving me the information. Right. Okay. So then the bridge scene, so, so far we have that the humanoids meet the cat people. And they're attacking, they attack them because they want them to return the baby. And when they, you know, how does this plays out? The humans have the Chronicles of Abraham. Yeah. Um, so and... the ending, the, the, I, I think we kind of messed, the ending first scene, right, is going to end with the human, with the cat people finding the human baby, not the humanoids, right? The uh-huh. bridge scene is going to bring in the humans with the 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 body suits. Ah, uh, okay. So the humans meet the cat people. Yes. For the bridge scene. Okay, so, sorry. That was my fault. I was I was not even thinking. I was thinking of the mutated creatures. I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we're. I'm mixing up our vocabulary. So the humans meet yes. the cat people, and yes. they and the way that they meet them is because the cat people are the ones with the baby. The humans yes. in the suits want to take the baby back and, and bring it yes. and like get a suit on it so that it will be like safe as well. And then yes. when they meet, they're going to either it's have a deep. conflict or work together or something. Yeah, right. That's up to the players. Okay. And then through this, they're going to somehow discover that there is something uh, that they're the chron- that they have a copy of the Chronicles of Abraham or they're aware of it or is this is this correct? All right, yes. But here's the thing, right? It's not going to be called the Chronicles of Abraham. Okay. It's going to be called like some manuscript that they have. Um, ah. You know, the technical the manual technical, of Abraham yeah. Long. What was his name? Abraham Livingstone. Yeah, it, it'll it'll just be like Livingstone Tech. Um, you know, um, I know, um, what's that? A uh, polymorph experiment two two four three two seven, right? Yep. The reason why the players would know that it's the Chronicle of Abraham is because it's gonna have the lo- the company logo of Abraham Tech of uh, whatever it is, right? I like it. So they're gonna be like, hey, that's the same thing that you know, because that logo is gonna be plastered all in this dome as you know, it's like the national religion. Okay, so this is also going to have the logo that hints that this is all part of some kind of experiment or? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. And you know, when, when you start building organically like this, yeah. you know, we reserve the right to go back and change some stuff. It doesn't make sense. You know <laughs> This this live stream does not represent a contractual obligation to use anything <laughs> that because the one thing that I guess Anthony and I haven't sort of mentioned at this point is that we are talking about running it. So here we are building it right now. I said, oh, yeah, Anthony, you should run it. He said, no, Matt, you should run it. And we had an argument that lasted 45 minutes where we went back and <laughs> forth about who should run it. Someone's going to run it. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe me. We'll, we'll find out. But either way, uh, yes, I oh, think that's important. We can get John Lamb to run it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. We should have him come on as guest, guest GM. John, <laughs> we've never met you. No idea who you are, but I'm going to put you live on my channel and, and just cross <laughs> my fingers that, you don't, that, that we don't get like banned. So we'll, I'm sure we'll be fine. Um, so, all right, the humans meet the cat people, they're attacking for the return of the baby, they have the Livingstone Tech Polymorph Experiment 3344227, and there's logos plastered all over the, the place, um, indicating that this is some sort of an experiment, and maybe people are, we're starting to sort of get this idea, there may be a GM intrusion in which the, the players, 
like as their cat characters yeah. kind of like see like some hints that maybe these cats aren't these cat creatures are not really cat creatures but they're somewhere some of them are somewhere between being full on yeah. cats and and half human cats um, and they can even find a bipedal cat person that doesn't speak English is speaking in cat tongue. Or, oh. you know what else would be cool too? They can find a dead cat in full cat form or something like that. Or, or half, you know, like half morphed back into cat form. And one of the player characters as a, a GM intrusion recognize the attribute or, or like a scar on their face. Hey, isn't that Ned that worked in the mailroom? You know, something like that. So the cat turns out to be someone they know. And all that could be handled with GM intrusions. Right. Okay. Is there anything else that we need to kind of like do let me ask you this is this basically your first th this is your process for creating your three scenes yeah. so we have an opening closing we have a bridge now um is there anything you do uh, to go in and start tightening things up or changing things yeah. based on what we All talked right. about what, what? I, what i usually do is, is like an old technique um like i i used to write a lot of freestyle lines when i was younger right and i use this old technique called sitting on it now I would sit, let this sit for two days, like what we have, and then I'll go back to it and look at it and be like, okay, this is trash, this is good, you know. Right. Like I'll sit back, I'll give, I'll give it two days, and I'll, I'll sit back, and now I'm gonna look at it, you know, from a new lens, a new perspective, because I have two days to not think about this, and then I'll go, okay, this makes sense, and then I'll start building. Those side plots that the I told you about. Finer details. Like we do a little, that. yeah, like the minor details. Like we still need the, like the bridge scene needs a little work. Yeah. To be honest, yeah. like I, we we need to. Um, it's I, I like the fact that we could put it in in any direction they go because I want to put it so that the humans, not the mutated humans, but the humans, are now hunting the players for the baby back. So now we have a way, like we have a concept that makes sense in my head that I can insert in any direction the players go to. Because now this resistance wants that baby back. Right. So we we create it, but it still needs a little fleshing out as in what information they're going to provide the cat people. Yeah. I think... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I kind of do a very similar thing. Like... I, I think what's really good about what we came up with is that we have three three parts. You know, we have a, a, a banger of an opening. We have like a, a bit of a twist there in the middle. And then we have like a resolution where things really get like amped up. And suddenly, you know, the twist is that there's a bubble within, a, or I should say there's a dome within and, a dome. Which I like that because it takes us to Planet of the Apes. It yes. was Earth all along. Right. Like all this is just, you know, it takes us back to the Planet of the Apes. Right. You know, like it takes us back to the, well, oh, snap. Not only is it humans, but not, all this is fake too. You know, it gives us that thing. And I like the idea. I want to play on more the idea of the 16-year-old cat transitioning mm -hmm. back to a normal cat. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure out why 16 is significant. We, right. ha we haven't really said that. Right. So that's something that I would actually sit down and marinate on. Yeah. And like, why are we using 16? What's the significance of, of 16? Right. You know, which we haven't really, but that's the Logan run element. So yeah. we really have to actually figure that out. Yeah, I, I think that this is a really great foundation to kind of start with because you have the thrust of all three scenes. And I think you're right. You We would probably have to go back and sort of refine these details so that there's some sort of like strong like thrust to the story. Like the characters have to like feel like they're being, you know, even though, of course, it has to be natural and they can't be like railroaded. But there has to be a feeling yeah. like they need to complete each scene. And they need some sort of clear objective, and we have to have the idea of a clear objective so that they feel like they're moving yeah. through the story. Um, but I, yeah. I like what I like about what we did tonight is that we kind of like 
I mean, essentially, we just built the world. You pretty much built the world. And by just sort of starting it with some, some basic elements, we were able to sort of come up with a, a very like skeletal kind of framework. Um, so you would wait a few days. So we're going to live stream for the next two days. We're just going to sit here, ladies and gentlemen, and wait. <laughs> we may be like, you know, on camera. just. I, like... think, I, think, we, I think we have a show. I, I think we have a good show. I, I like the concept of the ending. I like the concept yeah. of... of having two endings yes as in you brought up the idea of what if they go back i like the idea of them attacking the dome to be honest right but i also don't i i hate i like having rails without rails yeah so i don't want to play i want the that decision to be full on the players yeah and since you thought of so the we we decided that the the new york city subway system is the human resistance mm -hmm. so they're either attacking the new york city so we have to think about what's that look like what's the human defenses look like because are they teaming up with the humans to fight these androids so we have to think, think of that and also we have to think about what's the cat's defenses in this dome right and they're being attacked right you know so those are two other things that we have to actually go back and flesh out because believe it or not that but we have to have both those things started right up. no i i agree like there's some good things like um we haven't said it too many times but mm -hmm. and and we sort of it sort of went without saying though um as you as you as everybody knows from his t-shirt you know that anthony loves cypher and of course he's on the cypher limited channel i love cypher it's my favorite uh system uh, i've been running it for years now um, and the, the awesome cool system. thing that I that I like about it is how usually I can kind of like just say, OK, if I have to make a bad guy right now, I'm just going to make him a level six or a level seven. And then that pretty much is, is an easy way to very quickly make up a creature. But one thing I've sort of noticed is that when I do that, while it's good to do that, if the creature doesn't have any character and doesn't like have any kind of like interesting stuff, then it just becomes like rolling dice and backing, yeah. going back and forth. If there's some sort of interesting thing that the creature can do or an interesting quality or a special attack or, or something to it, it adds a lot of life. And I think Anthony's really right. I think we need to go back and maybe flesh those those details out. Yeah, I, like I like the idea of the mutated creatures having limbs falling off, ears falling off, or maybe like growths that um have acid on them or something that makes them unique to our world. Yeah. Like uh, elongated nails that now act as like um um like a six damage claws or something like of that sort. I, I really like the idea that how the cat people are actually smaller. But they don't know that they're smaller. I like I like that concept. We could play with that. The the mechs now how these are gonna work. I, like I like that concept because our cat like our characters have technology, but they might not have like um the technology the technology that the actual humans are sending in has to be way better than right. anything that's inside our world. Yeah. And that's kind of like that that raises some questions, too. Right. Because mm -hmm. if it is and like, let's say the cats don't seem to have any real tech or they their tech is very simple. How how can we stack the odds or at least make it a, a fair fight so that the players feel like they kind of have a chance or that they don't get swarmed or swamped? I mean, I think that's a question. That, that's why I went with the Technomancer, that the cats have magic. OK. Oh, so we Remember I said that earlier in yeah. the beginning? Yep. So they have some sort of mysticism about them. And we could just touch on it in the one shot. Like we don't have to fully flesh it out because it's a one shot, yeah. right? Like we could say the cats, you ever heard of like cats always land on their yes. feet? Nine lives. We'll play on that. It's like the, you know, the mystique. And if we ever played another game, then we could build out. Right. Like, right. like okay, what what does this mean mechanically? I like this. Well, well, Anthony, let me let me ask you. Do you feel like we've we've set down and laid a, a strong foundation? Are you kind of yeah, happy to I, sleep I on think this? I, yeah, and I, I think we'll sit down in a week from now and we'll craft out the, the fully flesh out the story. The but we have a beginning, a bridge, and an end. Yeah, and and, and I, I mean, I hope you you enjoyed my process. I did. It, 
it, I know this it's is great. Started, this is what, I, and and the point is, what, it's not whether I what I enjoy is watching you work and seeing how you build and how you create. That's the whole point. And I and I got quite a few. Like for me, it's also for selfish reasons. I like to watch the way that other people work so that I can like draw some inspiration from them. And and watching you work and I mean, I think there are a lot of ways that we are similar. There are ways we're different, and then there are ways that I learned that were new that I hadn't even considered that that I kind of got. You, you know, it's funny. Like I I told you off air when um when you were running us, and I saw your process, and I I told you I think I could never do that. No. You know. Yeah. Because I, and I understand why you did a it. A lot it of makes, people. Yep. It makes total sense, but for me, my brain doesn't work that yes. way. Yes. I a lot of people tell me they couldn't. They, they can't really do it my way. My way is very different. Um, it's it's like a ridiculous amount of detail and research. And what's weird is I often feel like what I do is I practice everything and I write everything out very thoroughly. And then I essentially take that and I throw it away. But I've got it in my head, right? And then I say, okay, this is the world. But then as soon as the players start injecting things, I'm mixing and matching to create something new. So I essentially will write like 40 or 50 pages or something and I'll you only use like 20 to 25 pages. Yeah, I, I try to make it as vague as possible so the players could inject. Your way is a much uh, mentally healthier way of doing it, <laughs> um, I think. Yeah, um, or also the input that you had, like I need, like I want all the player input in, in the world as I could get, but not in my frame. Right. Like my frame, I have to have control over. Yeah. Because if I don't have control over the frame, everything else is going to fall apart. But I think I think that's a really good thing, right? Because ultimately, and I know that you were trying to push me to run it, and we'll see who runs it. But ultimately, the, the person that's writing the frame is the one that's using it. And, and it's very difficult to take, like a lot of people, I think, think it's easy to just sort of like pick up a pre-made game and then run that pre-made game. But to me, it's almost more work because I feel like if I do something that goes off the rails, I become 100% responsible. But on the other hand, I then have to sort of look and see what goes on that's going to match up with it because I want something that continues the flavor. But mm -hmm. if I'm making it up in my head, I often feel like, eh, I can make it up. I know what the flavor is because I know what the world looks like on the other side of the dome or whatever. But maybe in a one-shot adventure that's written out, you might not know that. So uh, before you close it out, yeah. the, the last thing I like to do is I read the initial words, the you know, the emotion words that I wrote. And just let me know if we hit all these points on my emotion words. Right? My first one was the awakening. My second one was pheromones. My third one was the creator. My uh chronicles of Abraham, Utopian Society, Advanced Technology cybernetics and aha moment yeah. do you think we hit all those you hit awakens we hit pheromones chronicles mm -hmm. of abraham uh utopian society we might i think we might have to work a little bit on that um mm -hmm. but i think basically like the idea is that the cats live in this very idyllic kind of society so when i when you said utopian i kind of thought of high tech but actually now mm -hmm. i see it as more nature natural yeah. you definitely have advanced technology because we have the robots coming in and we have this this technology that's actually just doing this in in the first place um and then you have the cybernetics well yeah you sort of do right the suits themselves don't necessarily have to be suits they could also be cybernetic like enhancements or, or things used oh, yeah. to sort of help them they, survive. they could be like cybernetic bubbles over their mouths yes. to prevent the... something that like permits them to survive in these harsh environments um and of course we i think you have two aha moments yeah so i would i would say for sure um All right. cool i think we, I, anthony thank you very much for for doing this well, and, thank you this was awesome yeah this like was... I, said, I was excited to come in with no preconceived ideas for this game and i think we I mean, it needs a little work, but I, I think we actually hammered out a, I, a, a, a lot of stuff. And I think it's cool, too. I think it's really yeah. good. I don't feel like we just sort of threw something together and it's not going to be any fun. I think this is a yeah. really fun kind of wild ride. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, like you said, let's let's come back in a week. I don't know if we'll stream it. Maybe we will. That might be kind of nice. That depends on your schedule. Uh, my schedule is open and free, but we could always hammer more out. Um, but yeah. either way, we should definitely look at streaming running the game so that people can kind of see the process 
what goes on behind the scenes, and then we can sort of look at what happens when you when you throw players into it that are going to do something totally different. Yeah, and uh, now that you brought up the thing, I definitely want to. I'm going to make some pregens and work it out so it does, like you know, just mess around with the way the pregens look. Yeah. Like what what abilities right and that'll actually help us refine the scenes more because then we'll yes. know how to like build what, what our, the our enemies what the ciphers and, are yeah yes what the websites. yes where they're going to find them and and all yeah. of that yeah what because having this post apocalyptic outside is actually great for ciphers because yeah. now we could just we could use common items and a common item to a cat humanoid that doesn't have super high technology might be a cipher yeah yes right exactly exactly well you know like finding out in the wild that, you know there's a ton of things we can actually work on right like cocaine finding a bag of cocaine could ladies be a cipher. and gentlemen the views expressed on my channel yeah. are not necessarily the views of us here at manufactured myth and legend domain on the other hand they might oh that's be. a great side scene actually where they having find a, some sort of Having the players discover a Petland discount and finding catnip. <laughs> That's it. And that enhances. It's like a like a And it can also explain, like they'll find a bag with a picture of a household cat. What is like, what the, the hell is what's it? it is it called an effort enhancer? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something they like find a catnip, which is their effort enhancer. Yeah. There we go. Find, and they'll find images of pets, like humanoids with pets. I like this. And their whole world is turned upside down and blown because they're like, what's going on? Yeah. Um, well, Anthony, thank you very much for, for joining me tonight. This was a lot of fun. Um, for those of us out, uh, out there that are watching, uh, thank you so much for watching. Please do think about hitting the like and subscribe button. Uh, every subscriber helps. The likes, believe it or not, they help the algorithms because every time you like something, uh, that is uh, the algorithms that YouTube send it out and recommend it to other people. And maybe most of all, if you could, if you did enjoy what we did tonight, or if you enjoy another uh, show that I've done, if you could maybe share it or or spread the word, that would be great. Uh, channels grow. Uh, basically from from you viewers uh, and I don't I don't like to advertise and and shill and all that stuff I'd rather people kind of like you know it grow organic. Uh, I'll show for you please subscribe to Matt's channel. thank you and I was gonna say awesome. check out cypher and limited uh, they're a great channel these guys have been my friends uh, and uh, for for years now we've been talking and chatting uh, and and I really enjoy and appreciate all the help that they've given me with my own channel uh, as it as it grows. Um, but again, if uh, if you're watching wherever you are, um, please do uh, have yourselves a great game and uh, stay safe, everybody. See you in the next episode.